Jomar. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much for taking the time to do this today. You you're bet. a busy man. You're a busy, busy oh, man. You, you're busy yourself, so I appreciate <laughs> being invited into it. Of course, of course. So we go way back. We met in sixth grade <laughs> um, in Hemet, California. And growing up was, I don't know, I, I had a great experience. People talk badly about Hemet. <laughs> I mean, I wouldn't recommend going there now. It's a little different. But, um, oh. but, I, but I just have good memories growing up with you. And uh, we got a lot closer I think like right out of high school, which is interesting. Like my memories with you is like when Starbucks was first a thing, like when it was first became popular, we go to Starbucks and like listen to John Mayer and get our chai lattes. <laughs> I love that chai latte. <laughs> so, so good. Um, and you know, I, I, and then I remember you going off to college and me being really sad because like my friend was leaving and I, it's funny because I, uh, I didn't go to college and um, my only college experience was I came and stayed with you for like a week at the dorms mm -hmm. at, uh, I don't know if you remember this at LMU. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I remember. And I started meeting so many people and then I started introducing people and they're like, well, we're, like people thought that I went there because <laughs> for so long and I'm introducing people and they're like, Oh, what class, what are you majoring? And I'm like, Oh, I don't go here. <laughs> just, right, right, right. I'm just staying with a run. Right. Um, and yeah, but I, and I, what's interesting doing this podcast is I'm, I'm kind of talking to people that I've known for a, a long time uh, that I thought I knew pretty well, but there's a lot that I still don't really know about you. Uh, mm. There's, I know that you moved from the Philippines when you were young and I know that, and then after college, I don't know how. So for those of you that don't, Jomar is a coach, a life coach and uh, so much more. I mean, I've had the honor of working with you for a little bit and the impact that you made that you might not even realize that I mm. still think about today, and this was a few years back, um, it really, just working with you, the little I did, really helped me. Really, 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 really helped That you would be amazing to come on and kind of share your story of how you even got into it. Because even though we've known each other forever, I, I don't even know how, like... Last, I, I remember going to all of your, like, shows when you were in a band. Like, I thought you were going to be, like, the next Justin Timberlake and do all these things. And then I hear that you're, <laughs> you know, working at a school and now you're a life coach and you are amazing at what you do. And I thought, oh, I don't even you. know how he got into it. So I mm. would love to just hear your story and, and how you got into what you do. Um and yeah, and just and hear what I don't know. Yeah. And then we have a special surprise for people that they stick. We at the do end, have right? this special surprise. If you stick <laughs> at the end, I'm nervous and I'm excited. Yeah. So you're actually going to do a live coaching with me at the end yes, of, of the episode. And I am, uh, I'm excited because I know the impact that you made on me last time when I was working with you. And so I'm really excited. Mm. And I'm also nervous because I'm doing this in front of whoever's watching or listening. And so that's also <laughs> terrifying because I feel like I'm going to have to get very vulnerable. Right. Um, so, yeah. So then there's that. And I'm, yeah, I'm very excited. That. This yeah, me too. Um, thank you again for, for bringing me on. Um, it's interesting to share a space like this with you. So it, it, what I like to do is just call what's real in the present moment in my life. And as a coach and what I find myself noticing is, yeah, you've like witnessed me evolve through different phases of my life. There's a saying in marriage where, uh, you, uh, in your lifetime, you will fall in love at least a dozen times. And if you're lucky, it's with the same person. 
And I love that because it highlights how we all change, right? Like you, you should expect to be marrying a different person every couple years. And if you're lucky, it's the same. And for some of us, it's different and both are okay. But I think when you're, when you're like reflecting back our story together, it's, it's, yeah, I'm like, wow, like sixth grade up until now, I'm, I'm, I'm a much different person. I'm presenting as a much different person and also sort of including all of the things that I, I want to take with me, you know, those, whoever those previous versions are. So, so yeah, here I am. Thank you for bringing me on. I don't know. Where should we dive in first? My, I'm a coach now. Like what, what do you, what, where, where should we start? Yeah. Well, I, I find it, I kind of want to know, cause you were the popular guy in school always. <laughs> I feel like, like I, I just really like you were friends with everybody, mm. very talented and you have brothers that I know are the same. Like you guys were just like all known and like everyone loved you. And mm. I, I'm interested to know how that transition was from growing up in the Philippines and then moving at a young age, um, you know, to, to California. Was that scary for you? Was it exciting? Like, how, did you just fit in right away? Because I just know in sixth grade, like all the way through high school, like you were just like, right. everyone loved you. So oh, thank you. Um, how, how was that growing up? Um, it was, it was interesting. I mean, I, I, I came when I was 10, immigrated over, um, in the Philippines, they teach you English. So from a culture shock standpoint, you know, it was still there, but I was able to speak English. It was a very broken accented English. So, um, and, and honestly, like part of me felt ashamed of it, felt, felt ashamed of the accent. I, I didn't know that. I mean, if you, if, if I was, uh, yeah, if you, if we re rewind back to that 10 year old self, I wouldn't attach the shame language to it, but yeah, it was, it was, I was a little bit insecure about the accent. So what was that like? It was trying to assimilate and sort of fit in as soon as possible. Um, it was trying to act like just, I'm just, you know, I'm just one of my peers. Um, I was a musician pretty early on. So I really leaned into that to fit in. Like, you know, if I could, if I can play the guitar and like, you know, I found learning things to be quite easy. So these are like, I had sort of, I was blessed with these natural talents, inclinations that allowed me to sort of fit in. So I really leaned into that. And then when I moved to Hemet, we grew up in a pretty diverse town. Like our group of friends were all sorts of colors and backgrounds and we were all in the, in the same sort of socioeconomical mm -hmm. range of, of livelihood. You know, I, yeah. I very seldom remember like having one of our, someone in our friend group that was like, oh, that person is filthy freaking rich. I don't know yeah, if that happened I, at all. Yeah, yeah. I, I had a moment where I was talking about that uh, a few episodes ago, this podcast, when yeah. we were talk I was talking to someone about like Black Lives Matter and him growing up in like, you know, an all white neighborhood and being one of the only black kids. And I'm like, yeah, I guess like, uh, and yeah, I, I never felt like, oh, that person's hispanic or black or asian or white like everyone was very diverse everyone was pretty like much i felt like not wealthy like had a wealthier family than us or poor like everybody was just very diverse in like uh background and then i never i felt like everyone kind of just in my world at least like my experience of school was everyone kind of just got along and so mm -hmm. when it actually came to like and then i went on to um to work at like equinox kind of same situation so then when black lives matter happened and now just what happened you know recently with everything 
I, I felt like, uh, oh my gosh, I did. I guess I was kind of ignorant to this is still a problem because we grew up in such a diverse area and then working the places that I've worked has always been diverse. And so I feel like we were very blessed in that way to like have everybody kind of get along for the most part, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And I had, um, yeah, I had black friends, brown friends, white friends. I had white girlfriends. Yeah. I had brown girlfriends. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Maybe mm-hmm. I dated a black girl one time. Who knows? Um, so, so from a race standpoint, yeah, it didn't seem like a, you know, a super strong issue. Now looking back though, there were absolutely moments when, you know, racial discrimination happened as it does any, anywhere else, like where it was, it was happening to me and I just sort of ignored it and bypassed it. Cause I didn't want to, I didn't want it to be real or it was happening to a friend of mine. And I was like, Oh yeah, that's what that was. You know? Oh, wow. Yeah. Yeah. But again, you know, you're living in a town where it is, you know, pretty diverse. You're living, you're, you're growing up at an age where the most important thing for you to do is to fit in and to sort of Mm -hmm. ruffle any feathers there is not something anyone would do. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that's, that's, that was sort of the mindset that I grew up with. So, you know, interestingly enough, I'm a coach now and it's, uh, it's about, conditioning your brain to to have a new mindset but for most of us we have a very tribal mindset when we when we grow up you know it's Mm -hmm. rooted deep within us to be like you stay with the 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 thinking of the group and anything that's an outlier to this like is not welcome you know and and it's not Mm -hmm. you're sort of looked at as weird and you know whatever like that and so that was my experience growing up was just like yeah trying to fit in trying to sort of get everyone to like me people please and like lean into these talents that made me feel like I fit in mm-hmm. um it wasn't until college where that sort of uh distinction became even more embellished you know mm-hmm sort of that socioeconomic distinction was embellished and I became more aware of my skin color. I went to a predominantly white, highly affluent university. Mm -hmm. And um, again, if you were interviewing like the college me now, I don't know that I'd be able to articulate it like this. Right. Because again, in college, I'm still trying to fit in. I'm still, you know, I'm playing the same game. Like I want to fit in. I want to get people to like me. I want to have friends, you know, I want to do all of that. But my experiences in college is yes, definitely. Like my skin color held me back. Like I held myself back because of my own skin color and how I saw myself and, 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 you know, my background, being an immigrant, my skin color, all of, all of that would also played into factor in terms of like what social circles I would be accepted in. Um, yeah. That's so interesting to me that that's still, like I said, I, I just didn't realize that that was still a, and it's just my, I guess, I don't know, like my experience of things. I don't know why it is. I, I just didn't think that that was still going on these days. Like I just am so uh, ignorant to it, I guess, because from our experience growing up and now just in my adult life, everything's good. <laughs> like I just like I'm friends with everybody and when I see everyone, you know, not be treated d- differently. And so I feel I feel bad that you – we're going through that in, in college and like felt that way, like not even realizing, I guess that that's how you felt growing up kind of just like blocking it. It sounds like from your mind. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, that's yeah. That's how I cope. And here's the thing is I don't know that my peers, you know, my white peers um, were was consciously trying to be exclusive either because of, race or what have you you know maybe they were maybe absolutely there are probably some that were um but race and and you know belonging and social circles especially at that age is so complex and 
Um, there's a study, um, who was it? Uh, what's her name? Beatrice Chestnut. She talks about, you know, the unconscious and the subconscious and sort of our emotional intelligence and our mind, right? And she talks about basically our mind travels at 1x, our emotions travel at 10x. You know, mm-hmm. us, our awareness of our emotions travels at 10x, but the unconscious, the subconscious travels at like 100x. It's uh-huh. at a layer so deep, we don't, we don't even know, but it's like it's, it's um, directing our behavior in a way that we don't even know because it moves so fast. Mm-hmm. And so you place that truth within a context of college and you're sort of in this social thing that's happening and you don't know what these like unconscious things your peers were ta- taught around social circles and belonging and they don't know that like they might be behaving somebody because of the color of their skin or because how they might be perceived as poorer than you or whatever you don't know how that's playing out because right. You're in your they might not teens. even be realizing they're doing yeah. it. in your oh, teens. Wow. But, but, you know, and, and again, myself, I was just trying to fit in. So I might have been, you know, I might have experienced it, but I, I might have just brushed it off because I'm like, that's not true. It's not, I was probably thinking like you, I was like, that's not happening. It's, you know, 2008. There's, there's no way that's happening. Right. Um, right. But I would say the common theme. In, in, in growing up as an immigrant with brown skin in America is, is, is you know, just waking up to, um, waking up to my own insecurities, um, how I've allowed them to hold myself back, mm-hmm. waking up to that, and then just understanding that they don't need to anymore, understanding that these are all sort of mindsets and frameworks that you know, that that worked for me for a little while, but then, you know, they sort of don't need to anymore and and I can take what I want from it and I can move on and sort of develop new algorithms in here. Right, right. When did you come to really realize that? Oh, I mean, it was a slow burn. It was a slow burn. Um, You know, um, I would say like right after college, I had a pretty... Uh, I was pretty depressed and I was in love with, you know, this girl who, you know, is my wife now, Ashley. And I was working, I was trying to work that out and, um, you know, and, and, and there was this, uh, there was this moment in that relationship where, um, things have had gotten really bad. Like I was, I was starting to get, like we weren't even together, but I was starting to get really controlling. I was acting out as behaving in terrible ways. I was probably on the border of being verbally abusive. Um, Mm. And I didn't, um, we were, it's weird to like talk about this. Um, and it was rough. It was rough because I, I, I felt anxious all the time. I I was not getting good sleep. Um, but everyone else thought I was fine because I was, you know, showing up at church and, you know, I, I sort of had this, uh, uh, way of being that I could always fall back into, which is probably what you talked about. I was like, everyone likes you, blah, blah, blah. You know, but that was what, what was going on on the outside. But on the inside, I was like in turmoil. Um, why, do you, why do you think that is? I know you and Ashley met pretty early on in college. I remember mm-hmm. meeting her, I think your freshman year mm-hmm. uh, when I went to, to visit. And I knew you guys like hit it off right away and we're always together. And then I, all I know is that you would like break up and then get back together a little bit. And I didn't know what was going on. And then you're married. (laughs) (laughs) So what, um, what do you think if you feel comfortable talking about it, got you into that depressive state where you were just in a bad a bad place. Yeah, I think, 
It's a whole host of things, but you, when you've been ignoring so many symptoms for so long, it comes crashing down. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, college was, college is prime for that. College is prime for ignoring a whole host of symptoms and just partying your life away. Yes. Um, and then, you know, after college, I was just like, I felt like I had no direction. I felt like I was just like, going from one thing to the next. I, I was in a job. I was like, everyone else is like, you're working at a huge talent agency. And I'm like, I fucking hate it. I don't, I don't know that I want to be here. I have no idea what I want to do. And, and I, you know, um, and there was this woman that I cared deeply about and I knew I wanted to be with her, but we just happened to meet each other at a, at a, at a point in my life where I was still trying to figure out who I was. So sadly, she just had to be a part of that journey. And she was a part of being hurt because of, of that journey. Um, and interestingly, and interestingly enough, it was at the verge of losing her. And I actually, I think I did lose her at one point. I thought it was done. And, um, I had sort of had sat there and I'm like, I need, I need some help. Like I had like, I committed some pretty horrible, abusive things in that relationship and she had left. I was like, I need to own up to this and I need to, you know, I need to, um, I need to own up to it and I need to seek some help. And so I went and saw a therapist and I was in therapy for about three years. Um, and that word, that's when I think when I say it's a slow burn, that's when it started to change. What therapy opened up for me is the space in which I can observe myself, um, the space in which I can observe my behaviors, my past self safely mm-hmm. without getting caught up in the guilt and shame of it. And just like, oh, yeah, that was me. I did that. And mm-hmm unpacking why I did that and unpacking all of the things, the reasons why that happened in a safe space where I I can sort of separate the shame and guilt and like understand that. Um, And once I did that work, it became sort of this pattern where I can understand myself better. I can understand the way I behave better. I can understand when I'm at, you know, my, what, how I'm uh, seeing myself that's uh, dysfunctional to who I'm being. And I can, I can catch those patterns. Yeah. That's what I, I like about therapy right now. I, I switched during COVID from a traditional therapist to a hypnotherapist. And what I love is that, especially with the hypnotherapist, um, we spend an hour in therapy and then she puts me through the hypnosis at the end for like 30 minutes. And I, I feel like I, I can look at myself like on the outside, almost like looking at myself as like a, a, like from, from the outside, like and watching the situation of whatever it is play out like a movie. And I'm, and I understand myself better and can mm. take ownership for the things that I do. Cause sometimes I think with therapy, just talking about it, it's fine, mm. but you don't always like, I, I think like, look, like you can talk about it and still kind of block from your mind what you want to. And I think there's something about getting the, either the right therapist or just for me, the hypnotherapist, the way that she kind of like, okay, we just talked about this. She knows kind of where to walk me through in the uh, hypnosis. And then I can see things so much clearer and I come out like, oh my gosh, like, and I can take ownership better, I think, for the things that I need to change. And then uh, sometimes the things that like are out of my control that I try to control or um, and it's very, very eye opening. So I, I love therapy for that reason because it's very easy to just go through life and kind of ignore and block things. And yeah. then you have these moments of like depression and, you know, because you have gone so long without paying attention to those symptoms. 
Absolutely. Yeah. It was, um, it was, it was such a important part of the journey. Amazing. Yeah. So, so then after three years of therapy, somewhere in there, you got back with Ashley. Yeah. Yeah. Somewhere in there, we got back together. Um, you know, started building better behaviors. I want, I mean, it's still been a journey from there. You know, we've been married almost eight years now. Um, but it's also been a, a slow journey of uh, understanding what we both need for ourselves, what the marriage needs to nurture that. You know, there's sort of three different components there. Um, how we communicate, how we argue, how we fight fair. We're both pretty passionate um, when we fight. And so maintaining that passion without like burning each other when we fight has been um, has been a, a learning and, and I think we're getting a better hang of it now. Um, and yeah, I mean, and it, it was really, I would say that's really part of a big foundation is of why I'm doing the work I am now. Um, it's just, I know the transform what the transformation looks like once you do sort of that work. You know, mm -hmm. and it's a whole spectrum. You know, you can sit sort of in the yeah. therapy, but I, I sort of chose to be sitting in this part of the spectrum. Maybe you see it as a circle, but um, that's what got me curious about the work I'm doing now. Okay, so so within therapy, you kind of started getting interested in the work that you're doing, or how did you end up deciding that this is what you wanted to do with your life after being in entertainment for so long and, and that kind of, yeah, How I'd always, you... I'd always enjoyed um, deeper conversations. So that was mm -hmm. easy. And I thought that was therapy. And then I started to create distinctions around, you know, therapy and coaching, because I became sort of a career coach of sorts, you know, I was working with artists, and I was doing sort of like consulting, managing with artists. And then I you know, started to work for this startup where I did more career coaching. And so I started to like find different lanes within the mental wellness world of mm -hmm. where I sit best in. And, and then I, I found this lane, you know, at one point I thought I wanted to be a therapist. I thought I, 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 I started a program, um, but I wanted to sit here because it, you know, felt more creative to me. It felt more, dynamic is what the career could look like. You know, a lot of coaches aren't just coaches. They're, you know, they either own boutique firms, they run group coaching, they do, they work with companies. So I'm getting to do a lot of those things now. They can write, you know, they can, they can do a dynamic sort of path. Um, and, and yeah, you know, once you kind of investigate those little lanes you you start to see like other people doing it and then you start to invest in yourself in some programs and mm -hmm. um yeah that's sort of how i found yeah. about what i'm doing now yeah so for those that don't really know what a life coach is like how would you best describe what you do yeah um yeah life coach transformative coaching executive coaching these are all sort of good labels for what I've done. Um, I would say the best explanation of it is on my website, which is quick plug, jomargomez.com. Um, but I, the best thing that I, the best way to explain what I do is I help people understand their current mindset patterns um, objectively so that they can for themselves determine which they want to take and which sort of mindset patterns they want to adopt to achieve their next level of success. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I work sort of in the success realm, like therapy is very different in that in my, you know, broadly speaking, therapy is about unpacking the past. Coaching is about addressing the present to create a future. Mm -hmm. And then part of that is, is mindset. Part of that right. is, you know, stopping is understanding the mindset patterns that you have that aren't serving you that are so mm -hmm. unconscious. Mm -hmm. um, 
So yeah, does that answer your question? Yeah, yeah, totally. Yeah. And I'll just share like when I was working with you, there are two things that kind of stuck with me, one in like my romantic life and then one in my business life. Um, so when we were working together, I was in a relationship with someone with a daughter and it wasn't going well. And I was so attached to both of them that I didn't know if I could leave, but I also didn't know if I could stay. And I remember we, we drove up to this lookout point and you kind of walked me through this meditation and you had said, you know, take a, a step, you know, a couple steps forward. This represents like the next six months of your life. What do you see? You know, ask me questions. And then it went all the way up to five years from now. And what did I see? How did I feel? And I had seen um, not a face, but just a presence of, of a man. And he felt very light and fun. And it felt like we had this amazing uh, relationship. And he was holding what felt like the spirit of like a son. And we were in a white kitchen overlooking the ocean, which is like my dream is to have like a beach house. And uh, there was a, a, a book on the table with my face on it. And I just had this uh, feeling of being very successful, uh, both in my career and also like in my personal life. And it felt so just light and fun. And I came back to, you said, okay, come back to today. What is the first step you need to take to get to where you saw yourself in five years? And my first thought that came to mind was I have to end it with the man that I'm with now because that person in my vision is not the person that I'm with today. And his daughter was nowhere in that vision either. Mm -hmm. And I just felt very strongly that I knew what I had to do. Mm -hmm. And this is something that I was struggling with for a really long time. And I felt like I finally had my answer. Um, and so that was so helpful for me. And honestly, I still use it because I am newly single kind of, it's been like three months, I think. And, um, and so dating now, I kind of still have that image in my head. And if that's mm. not what I feel, then I let it go like immediately. Mm. I think that's been the biggest difference is I don't try to fit oh, well, I see these good mm. things and mm. ignore the red flags. That's where I've grown, I think, the most is when I see the red flags, I cut it off immediately and I move on. Mm. And um, But that uh, still sticks with me today, what you had me do that day. So, mm. uh, so that was amazing and life-changing for me. And then the other thing is I had told you I – I needed a certain amount of money by a certain amount of time and I'm freaking out and I'm like, I don't know what I'm going to do. And you were like, well, and I remember you trying to get me to come up with the idea myself and you helped a little bit. Cause I'm like, I don't know. You're like, what, you know, in your industry, like, how are you going to, you know, make the, this amount of money the fastest. And, and so long story short, we came up with this six week program and you're like, okay, let's come up with a plan. When can you get this done? And when can you get that done? And we set dates and, and certain things I needed to get done by certain times. And, and it happened. And it's something that I've thought about for a long time that I just, you know, never kept myself accountable to do on my own. Like, Oh yeah, I'll get to it, but never a plan, like never an actual plan of, of how to go about it. And I just thought it would be too hard and too expensive and too time consuming and, and I don't have time for it. And working with you showed me that it actually was way easier than I thought it would be. And it got done mm. and, and it was pretty successful. And I thought, man, this is, it made me see that anything is achievable as long as you actually have a plan and do it. It's the thing. The thing is I have a lot of ideas and people have a lot of ideas in general that never get done because they just don't go for it. They just think about it. So those are two things that I really took away from working with you that still stick to me to this day. And so during COVID, I wanted to do this podcast. I wanted to do a clothing line. 
And I think back to that time mm. working with you and I'm like, okay, like I could do anything. I just need to actually like have a plan and follow through with it. That's the only thing. And so, um, so thank you for that. Cause that was life changing for me. Mm. Oh, that's, that's so great. I love that. And I want to acknowledge um, you for that. You know, all, what we do as coaches is hold the space, hopefully ask some powerful questions. But at the end of the day, it's you, you stepping into and having that willingness to see differently. You know, and, and it, it, all it takes is a tiny shift. And because you were, you know, I invited you into this space and I was like, look, let's, let's explore this and see what we find but you had a willingness about you to, to step into that moment and say, yeah, let's, I'm, I'm willing to receive what's going to be given to me in this space. And that's, that's really where the power lies in the work is, is when sort of the receiver is open and willing to be, to be, to, and that, to, to receive that vision and then take action on it. There's a quote that I read today. It said something like, you know, the thinking of a thing um, over and o- over often leads to its own undoing. Yeah. Right. So if it stays here the whole time, like nothing really ever happens, right. nothing works out. And so receiving the insight, being willing to see differently and then taking action. Mm-hmm. Oh, I a hundred percent agree. That's something that I've learned too, is, is if something is on your mind, I feel like it's for a reason, whether you want to say God's giving you that, or whatever you believe, it's like, okay, I, I keep thinking I need to do this podcast and it's on my mind, but I'm not doing it. And then COVID happens and I'm like, well, I have free time and I don't know why I wouldn't do it. Um, so, so yeah, it's, it's like, if you, if you have something on your heart or on your mind to do, you know, to actually do it, or like you said, it's not, it's, it's never going to, amount to anything and Mm -hmm. and you might miss out on something amazing so yeah absolutely uh and so now you're to go back to your personal life you're now married to ashley eight years you have two beautiful kids Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah live out here in la um you know and and um i think even with all the things i've uh, i've uh, you know, been able to accomplish, I, I still think I'm just starting. You know, I think I'm, I'm at the, at the, at the beginning of my journey in this career and, you know, I'm, I'm in it for the long haul. And so there's a lot more, you know, in store for me. And, and, you know, honestly, my biggest frustrations these days are, uh, are wanting all of what's in store for me right here and now. Mm-hmm. You know, and I think that's how it is for everybody once they set out on this journey to really dream their big, biggest dreams and go for it, mm-hmm. you know, because it, it's, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a road less traveled for everybody. Like everyone walking sort of their hero's path, you know, um, is, is not for the faint of heart. Mm-hmm. And so I think really on that path, you know, the, the, the fun part that I get to do is I get to be just a part of that path. Like I think we're, I think, I think at some point in our lives, we fall asleep to the reality of who we truly are. Mm -hmm. And then if we're willing to do the inner work, we slowly wake up to the reality of who we truly are. Mm -hmm. And I get, you know, for the folks that I get to work with, I just simply get to be simply and humbly get to be a part of that journey. And then when you, slowly wake up to the reality of who you truly are, then the things you start to sort of uh, dream for or go for or pursue from that place Mm -hmm. has a different texture to it. Yeah, definitely. I might mess this quote up, but I, but I, I heard a quote a while back that said our biggest fear is not that we are inadequate. Our biggest fear is that we are powerful beyond measure. Mm -hmm. And I really feel that way. Sometimes it's just easier to just accept, you know, wherever you're at, even though you know that 
you could do so much, but that's really scary sometimes. And, you know, it might be a difficult. And so mm. it's just very easy to, but when you think that we're only here for such a short amount of time and we get like one go at this, as far as we know, then it's like, well, <laughs> why not? Why not go for it? You know, like why just settle when you know that you're meant for greatness, when you, you're meant to do something so big. So I I love that you decided to go down this path and to help people. It must be, I would think very rewarding to, to see your clients get so successful and get their dreams that like, you, you know, that they, they had in them, but they were struggling and might not have gotten there. And to see them get there, I'm sure is very rewarding for you. Yeah. I mean, that's, that, that's definitely a, a huge reward. I love seeing my clients, um, uh, achieve the things that they never thought they could. I think, I think that's amazing. But honestly, the biggest rewards for me is, are the insights, the, the tiny insights they experience along the way. Because it's those insights, the ones you were talking about, you know, the ones that they open themselves up to. It's mm-hmm. those that are sort of pay exponential dividends that'll keep paying off mm. in that journey. Mm-hmm. That's the fun part. That's the fun part. Um, yeah. Because, you know, it doesn't need to make sense to anyone else, but when it makes sense for them, we're like, mm-hmm. oh, sometimes not even like that. Maybe it's, it's like a, huh, you know, an insight <laughs> feels like this, huh? Yeah. No, you're like, interesting. Interesting. Yeah. Um, that, that's the stuff that sort of keeps paying off. Wow. Yeah. I love that. I love yeah. that. So should we get to it? Yes. All right. I'm so, so scared. <laughs> let's let's I know try we're, it. You, let's see. Yeah. Let's see what we have happens. Like 30 we, minutes and then we yeah, both we have bit. meetings. Yep. So, let's oh what my happens. goodness. So, so to everybody, okay. we're going to, we're going to shift. I'm going to play coach now and you're going to see a live coaching uh, session like, with Morgan. I feel like I need water for this. <laughs> <laughs> I'm nervous. She's, she's, uh, yeah, courageously volunteered. And let's see what happens. Let's see. Okay. Let's see what happens if we play a little bit. Um, okay. So let's just give it a moment. And uh, give it a moment. Allow for us to sort of switch hats. Mm-hmm. We're in, this, we're in this space now. And I'm going to mess with your thinking. Okay. 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 And so I'm going to ask you a question. Um, yeah. Sometimes it's as, as simple a question as like, what would, like if you walked away from this conversation today and you just had this sense of like, wow, that was that was really meaningful and powerful and impactful. Let's say you had that like, oh my gosh, wow. All right, mm-hmm. what, would, what would we talk about? Well, the two things that come to mind would be either something with just my purpose, I guess, would be like what I'm – I have all these ideas and things that I want to accomplish, but like we said, I I do, I I am doing some of those things, but there's so much more that I want to do. And I guess it's, if we, if we talked about, I guess like how to, to make sure that I accomplish all the things that I want to accomplish and in the in, in the order, I guess, that I need to do those things or the next steps that I need to take. I feel like I've come a long way since the last time that we spoke and doing the things that have been on my mind, but there's still all of this other, all these other things that I want to do. Um, but like you said, like sometimes I feel like I put limits on myself as far as like, well, I've never produced a show. No one's going to take me seriously, but I have these two shows that I think are amazing that I want to start pitching and, and get out there and, and create. Um, I just don't, I have them and, and now I don't really know cause I don't have an agent. I don't have representation. And so it's hard to get meetings. And so just, I guess like trying to figure out like, 
what I should do to get there. So I'm not just sitting on this idea and watching someone else do it eventually and not me. Um, or it would be something in relationships because obviously like I'm still, I'm single and I have it on my heart to be married and have kids and I'm 34. So I know that like, obviously clock is ticking at the same time. I would never just get married or have kids just to do it. Like I, I want to make sure that it's right and I meet the right person, but I also like in therapy uh, have learned that I have been kind of attracting maybe the wrong people because of beliefs that I had subconsciously all these years that came from childhood. Um, so just something along the, like, either the professional side or relationship side, something to like yeah. help me guide me through one of those things. Okay. Um, so sometimes I'm inclined to get, you know, to get sort of in the, in the sandbox and just start playing in the sand with my clients. But right now in this moment, I'm, I'm inclined to like fly up higher. Okay. And see what we find. Um, let's, let's, let's zoom out 10 years from now and you're 44. Okay. Okay. You're 44. How do you want to be known at that point in time? At 44, I would love to be known as someone who has created. Okay. Okay. So let's, sorry, let me pause you there. Um, speak as if it's Already now. happened. Yeah. I am. I am. Speak okay. as if I am. Yeah. At 44, okay. I am dot, dot, dot. Okay. At 44, I am successful from things that I have created that have helped change people's lives for the better. Um, I am married to someone that I love who loves me. We have this amazing relationship. I am a mother. I, you know, have kids. We have this amazing family. I am happy in all pillars of life. I am healthy. I am successful. I have written my book. I have my TV show. I have, you know, just inspired people and helped people through things that I have created. And I am just happy with my family and my friends and my career and my husband and my kids. How have, how have you helped people? I have helped people by helping, encouraging them to live their best life by being healthy physically, emotionally, spiritually, um, from not to like give too much away about the show, but, but from a young age, just kind of changing the way that kids watch TV, um, that parents, um, kind of, how do I put this without giving this away? Uh, just help, helping families in general, like helping families to just live a healthier lifestyle and teaching the kids and themselves at a younger age, just a different way of, of living that's healthier. Um, and hopefully just inspired people to like look outside of, of maybe how they were raised and kind of just have like an overall healthier way of of living when it comes to like their health physically but also like emotionally and spiritually and, and why did that why was that such a deep mission for you because i was raised um not knowing that you could have fresh fruit and vegetables no one taught me as a kid that uh like you know what vegetables and and certain fruits like were and everything that i ate was from a box or a can for the most part 
Um, so I didn't know until my adult life, like that you could eat, uh, like fresh green beans or fresh fruit. Like I just thought fruit cocktail in a can or like peas or green beans in a can was it. And so I just would love, you know, that's like where my passion came from is, is I didn't know how to eat healthy. I felt like gross all the time and thought that that was normal and I see my family and they've kind of done what their parents did and so my family is typically like most of them very unhealthy and overweight and I see how they struggle with their lifestyle just at a very young age just watching them try to get up the stairs and I'm like that's not normal for 59 years old um, so my passion came from just seeing myself and my family and wanting to, and just knowing that came from generations and generations of lifestyle. So I wanted to try to teach kids and young parents young early on that you can live a different way and you don't have to have the, the issues health wise that you have, um, or feel uncomfortable when you eat, if you eat the right things and you do the right things and just giving those kids and adults the opportunity to kind of learn about nutrition and being yeah. active. Well, this is nice. This is really nice. What's missing? Why, why is that? Why does that matter so much to you? I guess it just matters well, because it really affected me, like, growing up, I guess. And I just have to think that it affects other kids, um, not only with my own um, insecurities about what I look like or how I felt, but also, like, with pe kids making fun of my mom for being overweight. And it really affected me personally. And then I have been working with kids, like, young teenagers and um, – for a long time that all kind of have similar stories of how they're feeling and their insecurities. And, um, and so I guess like hearing their stories and kind of thinking of myself, I think, Oh gosh, it's like, it's just on my heart to kind of help kids to, um, so that they don't feel that way. Cause it really affected me. So I guess if that answers the question. That's kind does of, it, I mean, I it doesn't matter if it answers it for me. Does that feel like it answers it for you? Yeah. Okay. And so as you lock into this uh, who you want to be known by in, in 10 years, how, what did this person need to do to sort of create the world in which she was living in? So just, so what I have to do for what the did, next two yeah. years to. Yeah. Let's say like, you know, this person, this version of you, uh -huh. you can sort of embody her. She's yeah. made the move she needed to make. Mm -hmm. She's locked in. She's yeah. created community. Mm -hmm. She's created uh, a body of work that has been impactful in people's lives, mm -hmm. right? She's made a difference. She's got a husband who loves her for who she is and supports her for her continued evolution of who she is in her business. And so there's this very much supportive thing there. Mm -hmm. And the kids, right? There's this sort of expansion that you felt about this 44 year old Morgan Mm -hmm. what did what shifted for 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 this version of you i think what shifted is just knowing my self-worth and who i am and and what i want and just going for it as far as figuring out like who I need to go to for the things that I want to do. Um, as far as the, the show, 
like getting the representation that I need, getting the show out there, taking the steps to, to get that done, writing my book, um, just going for it, even though like I was scared to, to do it, like, because I'm not like technically qualified on those areas, just doing it anyway and getting it in front of the right people and having it be successful. And I think through that, everything else kind of just falls into place, right? Because yeah, tell me, let's capture that really quick. You said going for it, even knowing you made a faith. Like, what, let's <laughs> capture that. Because I knew you were going to say that. Yeah, because what was I that about? The, because I struggle with, even though I know consciously that I need to get the limits out of the way, that I'm not a writer, so I can't write a book. I'm not a producer, so I can't produce a show. Like I need to get those beliefs out of the way. And I know that consciously, but subconsciously it's really difficult for me to sit down and write a book when I'm like, where do I start? I don't know what I'm doing. Like that's, it's hard for me to like, to change that mindset. Mm. Well, what if, what if that's exactly the mindset you need? Okay. And just do it anyway. Yeah. 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 No, I'm, what do you mean? Yeah. What, what's it? What hit? What hit? Are you like getting? it might, it, I mean, it might work. You know, just to write it myself and and just see where it goes. One of you the know. biggest insights that I experienced from my coach is what if you don't need to be ready? What if you just need to do the things before you're ready? Okay. What do you hear when I ask that? Or what comes up when I ask that? I think, yes, it, it could work. Just sitting there writing it, even though I know I'm not ready, maybe getting an editor, obviously that, that's what you do, to like help, you know, help out and, and all of that. But I guess, yeah, I don't know. I don't, I, I just don't feel all the time that it's I don't know why I have like doubt of myself you know and that's just my own thing like when it comes to the to book that's just how I I feel I have this like I have it on my my heart to write a book about my life and to do you know but then I and I think yeah maybe it would be cool to just like write it even though I'm not ready or I don't know what I'm doing and, and just maybe it'll turn out amazing. And then I think, but what if I do all that work and it doesn't? And then I just, you know, and then with the show, I feel more confident in it, but I still feel like I need to, I don't know the, the how to get representation when I haven't done anything and I don't know how to get it out there. And, and so I, I don't know, like, what direction to go, like, who to contact. And so it just sits there. And so, like, I did, I did the work with the show not knowing what I was doing. I, I had a friend that helped me with it, and we got it all ready, and we are ready to start pitching it. And then it kind of, like, fell apart after one pitch, uh, our team that we had, and I just never – did anything with it after that and mm. because my connection to that world was gone when when our team fell apart and then I just thought okay well I'll figure it out later and then I never did mm. um so yeah I don't know what comes up as far as like I think yeah I could I could just do it before I'm ready and and see where it goes but I guess my what comes to mind is but then you've already done all of this that has been fun, but time consuming and it hasn't gone anywhere. And now I feel mm. like 
I don't have the time to put into things that aren't going to go anywhere. And then that's, if I'm being honest, like that's what comes. That's the block. Yeah. Yeah. I feel that. Yeah. I, I feel that sense of like, what if it amounts to nothing? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Here's another, um, here's another thing I'd like to offer. May I offer another thing? Mm-hmm. So you're looking for that. Yes. Right. Some sort of yes from the universe. Like, mm-hmm. yes, here it is. It's yours. Yeah. Right. Yeah, yeah. What if the, what if that yes lives in a whole land of no's? It's possible for sure. Okay. Yeah. So if it does, how would you operate? Would you operate the same way or would you operate differently? I guess I don't know how else to operate, I guess. Like when you say when you say like the, the your yes can, can live in a land of no's, I still like say that I, yeah. I mean, I guess when it comes to like writing, like I'm not opposed to just sitting down and writing this book and like, but I still, and I don't, I don't mind being rejected when I go to pitch the show. I guess it's just, like I said, getting, figuring out how to get it in front of people. Okay. Um, I don't like, it's like, that's my block when it comes to the show is like that step of, I don't like it. It's, I don't know like what my next step is, I guess, or like who to even contact for that. You don't know who to contact for that? No. What if I messed with you and, and maybe you do know who to contact with that? (laughs) Um, Okay. <laughs> what if what if you looked at your phone right now and your contacts and maybe you uh-huh. looked at your emails? Uh-huh. And what would the request be? Yeah. I mean I might have somebody. So you might have somebody. But yeah, I might have somebody. But this is the thing too though, is I have a couple of people that I know could help me, but when I mention it and I have a a problem with asking very successful people for help, sometimes I'll just kind of mention it and I don't flat out ask and see what they say. And so I'll tell them like, I don't really know what to do with it, but I have this show and they say, yeah, it sounds great. You should do it. I go, well, I don't know how to, I don't know who to contact or what to do. And they Mm. go, oh yeah, you'll figure it out. And I don't flat out ask, but they could help me if they wanted to. Mm. And I feel like because I've mentioned it and they haven't mentioned anything bad, that I, if I flat out just asked, they would say no. Cause I assume, I guess that if they wanted to help, they would have offered in that moment. So if 44 year old Morgan was here and he, she was hearing you talk, say your response to that. What would she, how would she say, what would she respond to you? Just ask. <laughs> That's what she would say. Why, why are you laughing? <laughs> Cause it seems so it's like a no brainer. It is. Just flat out ask. Okay. Cause the worst okay. you can hear is no. Okay. Okay. And then how would you respond to that 44-year-old Morgan? Okay, I'll ask. (laughs) Yeah. Okay. Okay. So you're going to ask? Yeah, I'll ask. Okay. Well, how are you going to ask? I'm curious. Yeah, like what what, what do you think I'll say? So I can, I'll just say I have that show that I was telling you about and I'm really serious about getting it going. Do you have anyone that I can contact about pitching it to? Mm. Why? Why does it matter that you're serious? Why, why are you so serious about getting it going? 
because it's been on my mind for a while. I've done all the work up until this point, and I just feel like it's time to okay. be serious about it and get it done. Okay. So 44-year-old Morgan was here, and she heard you with that pitch. What would she say? I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. What would she say? And she heard you say that pitch. I have no idea. You don't know what she'd say? No. I mean, it sounds good to me. Very simple and to the point. Okay. Great. I wasn't hinting at anything. I just, I was curious. I was curious what I thought, what I think you think she'd say. Well, the really, yeah. I feel like I just need to flat out ask and stop being, stop assuming that people are going to say no. And if they do say no, then it's just a no and I can move on. But yeah, I think that there are a couple of people that I can ask. And there's someone that I don't know. This is a, there is somebody that I know not very well who is a producer but is not super successful. Um, and he said, but he knows, like, the right people, and he said, give me everything, uh, and didn't really say why. I just told him about the show, and he said, just send me everything. My fear is that they'll steal it because that happens all the time. So for me to just send someone that is willing to help me, but not know very, I don't know him very well, don't know who he's going to show it to. And for me to just send him everything that I've worked on to this point is also very scary. So it's like, yes, I could. Let's, let's play that out for a sec. Let's play out that fear for a sec. Let's say he does steal it and then it launches and it's super successful. Oh, what are you going to do? Well, I can't really do much at that point you can't Why? really sue them because you can try to sue but from what i've heard you never win those things and then you're mm. in court forever and it just gets expensive and at the end of the day like you most likely won't win anyways because they change it just enough to where you can't really prove that it was yours um so i feel like in that situation i would just lose that one and that would suck and then would you give up no but it's definitely like something that i'm passionate about that's been on my heart for a while that i've done a lot of spent a lot of hours and work on okay so, so let's let's acknowledge just, that let's acknowledge that right it's very unlikely that someone's going to steal something i hope that doesn't happen but when I asked, would you give up? Your immediate answer was like, no. 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 So no. once you've answered this call, mm -hmm. you're in. What I mm -hmm. hear from you is like, once I, I get going, I'm in and I'm not going to accept failure mm -hmm. as a reality. I'm going right. to keep going. Yeah. Okay. Definitely. And so what do you make of that? Well, I should probably just give him a shot and send him everything. Because then if it does get stolen, then you're right. Like, then, then I just come up with a new idea. And at least, even though I don't get credit or the financial benefits from it, at least it is out there and it would help in the way that, like, I would hope it, it would. Um, as far as like kids and families and everything, I think it would still it would make an impact. It just, it would, yeah. And then I would come up with a new idea. Yeah. So if it was 44 year old Morgan here, mm -hmm. this 44 year old Morgan, did she, was she somebody that would have given up? No. If things were stolen? Okay. What would she have done? No. Just kept going. Yeah. Like, new ideas and, and figuring it out yeah yeah because she believes that yes i'm hoping you finish my sentence <laughs> can live in the land of notes yeah. yeah so if i were if i were you i would just be like i want you to collect 
knows. If I was your coach, I would be like, your assignment in the next 30 days is to collect as many no's as possible, to collect 100 no's. Okay. Oh. Because look, look what happened. We, 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 we just made up a no, which uh-huh. is like someone stealing your, your right. uh, script. And then what happened after that one no is like, we sort of imagine a new version of you showing up despite of that, which is like, screw it. I'm going to keep going. Right. So right. imagine if you collected a hundred no's, what other versions would show up in, in, wow. in, in front of all of those no's? Yeah, I love that. I love that. Yeah. Jomar, you're good. It's not me. It's you too. <laughs> no, that is good. And, and I love the whole collecting a hundred no's thing because at least I'm actively doing something and who knows where that would end like maybe i do get a hundred no's but because i'm act- actively out there figuring it out i get one yes or something else happens in that in those no's yeah you've literally opened up a whole sea of possibilities right because of all of those no's you've collected right that didn't otherwise exist before because you decided that I'm going to be sitting here. And, right. Right. Chomar. Are you going to collect some no's? I'm going to collect a lot of no's. All right. Well, I hope you tell. I'm report back. I hope you tell your audience how that <laughs> works out for you. Because <laughs> so, now you're on the hook. <laughs> I am. Ladies and I gentlemen, am. everyone listening, I want you <laughs> to <laughs> check on Morgan 30 days from when she launches this today. And just get curious about how many know she's collected. Okay. I'm going to get on it. Oh, it's a little, it's more, a little, feels a little scary, right? <laughs> that would be it's awesome. scary, but it's also exciting because yeah. uh, this has been – almost two years now that I've just been kind of sitting on this project going, I want it to happen. I want it to happen, but I'm waiting for that thing to come to me. And like, how often does that work out? So this whole new collecting nose is going to be really scary, but exciting too. um, Because it means I'm actively making it happen. I believe in you. Thank you, Joe. Thank you. Truly. Thank you. I appreciate it. It means a lot to me. You've done a lot for me that you, I don't think, realize. Mm. So. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you for taking the time. I know you're busy. (laughs) Busy man. So thank you for coming on here. We will have to meet for coffee soon. Yep. I haven't even met your kids. Oh my gosh, yes. But I haven't well, even but met that's a whole nother conversation. A whole nother conversation. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But yeah, you'll meet the kiddo soon. Okay, sounds good. Love you, Joe. Love ya. Bye. See you. Oh, real quick before we leave, mm. where can everyone find you? Oh, right, right. So my website is jomargomez.com, J-O-M-A-R-G-O-M-E-Z.com. And I write weekly on Substack, which is jomar, J-O-M-A-R, dot substack, dot com. Awesome. And your Instagram? Do you mean to know that? Oh, yeah. Instagram. I'm on there sometimes. Uh, uh, jomar J, J-O-M-A-R. I don't see. That's how often I'm not on there because I don't even know. Well, we'll find you. We'll J-O-M-A-R-J-A-Y find you. J-O-M-A-R-J-A-Y underscore, I think. Okay. I'll find you and then, or, you know, I have you and then we'll, we'll put it for the, for the people so they can check Love you out for the people. <laughs> Thank you. I will right. see you soon. All right. Thanks my friend. Bye. Bye.